Um, thank you for coming tonight. This is a forum for the Republican <coughs> candidates for the Maryland House of Delegates <coughs> District 36. When you vote, you can vote for up to three candidates, but no more than one per county. So to start, I'm going to ask you all to stand up and we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. <coughs> So this forum is presented by three of the leagues of the um, League of Women Voters of Maryland, Kent County, Queen Anne's County, and Midshore, which is Talbot County, Caroline County, and Dorchester County. I'm Barbara Sharkey, and I'm the current president of the League of Women Voters of Queen Anne's County. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization that promotes political responsibility through informed and active participation of citizens in their government. To maintain our nonprofit status, the League of Women Voters presents forums only with candidates who have at least one opponent running and are and also participating in the same forum. Before we get started tonight, I just want to point out two things. <clears throat> Sorry, I have to put this down so I can show you. <laughs> the League of Women Voters Voters Guide has been printed and is now available for all of you. It's going to be distributed um, this coming week, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, in just about all of the local newspapers. I do have some copies here that you can take if you want to get it beforehand and we will be putting them in the public libraries and um, various other places around the county. I'm sure uh, Midshore and Kent County will be doing the same thing. What this is is it has every, can, every candidate you will see on your ballot and they have all been asked questions and they have all answered the questions and it's all printed in here. So it's a, you can take it home and you can compare the candidates and see what their answers are and, and it'll help you make a decision when you go into actually cast your ballot. The other thing, um, on Thursday, June 7th, we're sponsoring a forum right here again for the Republican candidates for Queen Anne's County Commissioners and also a meet and greet for the Board of Education District 2 candidates and clerk of the court candidates. The meet and greet will be at 6.30 and then the commissioner forum starts <coughs> at 7. So I want to thank Queen Anne's County TV for recording this so you'll all be on Queen Anne's County television. Thank you Jeff for setting all this up and handling it. So tonight our panel consists of the following candidates. Jeff Greist from Caroline County. Michael Smeagol is not here. Jay Jacobs from Kent County. Steve Arents from Queen Anne's County. And Rick Bowers from Queen Anne's County. And Wick Dudley from Queen Anne's County. Our moderator tonight is Ms. Gwyn Schultz. Gwyn is one of the founding members of the Queen Anne's County League, and she served on our steering committee before we had a board of directors. Gwyn previously served as one of our past co-presidents, and her, she and her husband have been residents of Queen Anne's County for 26 years. So Gwyn will now take over the forum, and she will explain the rules. Thank you, Gwyn. Okay, good evening. Um, tonight's forum is in going to be presented in three different sections. Um, during the first section, we're going to ask each of the candidates to provide an introduction, and that will be followed by questions from the audience. And then finally, um, when we bring it to closure at about 8.30, the, the candidates will have an opportunity to give some closing remarks. Um, I'm going to get into more of the details about the audience questions uh, later on, right before we get into that section. Um, so what I'd like to do um, is remind you to turn off your cell phones <laughs> before we get into the introductions. 
And then I'm going to provide an opportunity for each of the candidates to give a two-minute introduction. And we've picked the order for those introductions. And then when we do the closing remarks, we'll be reversing that order. So um, I'd like to kick it right off with the introductions. And our first one is um, Rick Bowers. Thank you. I'd like to thank uh, the League of Women Voters for putting this on this evening. I'd also like to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to come here are your choices for a delegate in District 36. My name is Rick Bowers, and I'm running for the Maryland House of Delegates. I believe my core values of God, family, country, constitution, and common sense resonate with the district of 30, uh, the district that I'm trying to represent, District 36. I also believe there are major areas of concern that have not been addressed properly by the current delegates. My political involvement began with my interest in amending the state constitution to divine marriage as a union between one man and one woman. From there, I ran for State House of Delegates in District 13 in 2006, Columbia, Maryland. I served as policy analyst and writer for Delegate Warren Willer Miller, District 9, served Senator Alex Mooney, now Congressman Mooney from West Virginia, as, as his legislative aide. I've served on numerous boards, both locally and nationally, and as partial list will be the Maryland Taxpayers Association, the MDGOP State Planning and Goals Committee, led by then Lieutenant Governor uh, Michael Steele, World Ministry Fellowship, uh, National Advisory Board, Community Action Council of Howard County. Uh, Governor Hogan, a couple years ago, appointed me as a consumer member of the State Board of Plumbing, where I currently oversee all the continuing education units for the state inspectors. I've served as president of the Queen Anne's County Republican Club, and currently I'm the vice chair of the Queen Anne's County Republican Central Committee. I'm a lifetime member and resident, um, resident of Maryland. I'm an independent insurance agent, a retired pastor, and I've been married to my lovely bride, Cheryl, for 38 years. We have three adult children and eight grandchildren. I believe I am the best suited candidate to be your voice in Annapolis because once again, I believe my core values of God, family, country, common sense, and constitution best represent the, 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 the tenor of District 36. And for more information, please visit my website, it's rickbowersmaryland.com. Thank you very much. Thank you. A couple other things that I'd like to mention, I forgot to, is um, first of all, for the candidates, we do have some timers right up front. <coughs> and folks in the audience will also, you'll be getting some notes about timing when you come up for um, audience questions. So this will give you a 15 second uh, warning as well as a little stop warning. Um, and then also, just for the audience, um, I know if you get enthusiastic about something, you might want to applause, but we're hoping that everyone can hold off on your applause until the very end so we get as much time as possible for um, audience questions and answers. Okay, uh, Mr. Dudley. Okay. <laughs> all right, um, well, once again, uh, and as Mr. Bowers said, uh, thank you all for coming here tonight. Uh, I should probably apologize for those of you who are expecting a 66-year-old bald man who's never sported a beard in his life. Uh, my <laughs> father, Wick Dudley, is not a politician. In fact, he disdains all things politics. So if you've seen his signs and thought, how in the heck is Wick Dudley doing this? That's why it's his son not Wick Dudley, for various reasons. Technically, I'm not a junior, so I cannot differentiate from him unless I go by Wicky Dudley, which, considering I just graduated from law school, I'm trying to clear away from that. <laughs> um, and while in law school, last couple of years, uh, while a full-time law student, I was working for FOP attorneys over there at Schlock, Mabelsky, and Wiener, um, which provided a wealth of experience and information and insight into a very interesting, uh, you know, modern something rather that's going on in the world these days with, with police activities and I've got experience with the FOP and I think being a full-time law student while working three days a week at a law firm is testament that to my work ethic and my ability to work as hard as I possibly can for the constituents of the Eastern Shore. I'm a multi-generational, uh, my family's been on the Eastern Shore for generation after generation. In fact, my mother's maiden name is Greenhawk because they have Nanakoke Indian uh, in, in that side of the family. So to be perfectly clear, I am very much a shoreman. Uh, I'm a hard worker. I've got a legal background, which I think will do wonders uh, to be a lawmaker uh, over in Annapolis. And I'm looking forward to fielding your, or answering your questions. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Mr. Grace? Thank you uh, very much. And, and I'll, too, uh, sort of echo what they were saying um, in regards to uh, thanking you all for, for coming out. And um, this is obviously a very, very important part of um, the uh, democratic process um, to make sure that um, you all allow us to engage um, the public and, and uh, we can certainly deliver our message. Uh, I currently serve in the House of Delegates on the Appropriations Committee. I grew up on the Eastern Shore uh, and from Caroline County. 
Uh, went on to uh, graduate um, with a degree in economics from Salisbury University. And I served uh, two terms as county commissioner in Caroline County. And this was during um, arguably the, the, the eight most difficult years uh, economically that our country's ever faced. It was during the recession. And I was certainly very proud to be part of uh, a team in making decisions and, and leading the way um, through that time because um, we were able to do that uh, without uh, raising taxes. In fact, we were uh, we actually lowered taxes on, on one occasion, and we were also able to provide a, a senior tax credit uh, during those eight years uh, as well. And um, we we did all those things, and we were still able to provide great service to the public. Um, we did not sacrifice anything um, in regards to service, and I'm very very proud of that. And and I say that because I took a lot of what I've I've learned and a lot of those things that I did as county commissioner to Annapolis. Um, and it served me very well uh, on the Appropriations Committee because, um, you know, my role as a team, and it's certainly been a huge honor to serve uh, with Delegate Aarons, uh, Delegate Jacobs, and Senator Hershey. And so my role is, as a team member um, on the Appropriations Committee, one, um, is to work with Governor Hogan, work with Department of Budget Management to, um, to develop a, a good budget, a fiscally sound budget, uh, one that um, also takes care of uh, Marylanders and also takes care of the residents in, in District 36. Um, and then um, also to, to also control spending um, as well, and also um, provide uh, money rather than uh, money going to Baltimore City, Montgomery County, and Prince George's County, where we've seen for so long, uh, we're able to bring a lot of this money that's in the budget back to District 36, and we have a lot of success stories there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jacobs. Good evening. Uh, Thanks. Thank you to the uh, League of Women for having this forum this evening and thank the audience for being here. My name is uh, Delegate Jay Jacobs. I'm currently uh, seeking my third term as, as delegate. I'm the ranking, or mem I mean the uh, senior delegate from the mid and upper sh eastern shore. I'm the ranking member, minority member on the Environment and Transportation Committee. I'm a member of AELR, the Regulatory Oversight Committee, a member of the Maryland Dairy Oversight Committee, and Nutrient Management Commission. I'm a fourth generation resident of Rock Hall. I served as the mayor there prior to being elected to, in the House of Delegates for 12 years. Um, I have, uh, I actually live in the house my grandparents built, so I, I care a great deal about a heritage and the core values of the Eastern Shore and uh, I do my best to represent our core values and the principles of the Eastern Shore. Half of my family were farmers, the other half were watermen, and uh, I am uh, a real advocate on, in both those industries, uh, along with other industries as well. I'm a small business owner and have been for uh, many years, so I have a great deal of knowledge when it comes to being a, signing the front of a check and also being a, a uh, administrative executive. So I look forward to uh, the questions this evening and thank you for being here. Great. Mr. All right. Harris. All right, thank you. Um, good evening. I'd like to thank, once again, thank the League of Women's Voters for having us here tonight. I think this should be an informing, informant, informative evening for all of us. Uh, my name is Delegate Steve Arents. I'm married to my wife, Bianna. We've been married 22 years. I have a daughter, Elizabeth, who attends the University of Maryland, and a son, Stephen, 16, who attends Canada High School. Um, I believe my background is kind of fit for this. I've been very fortunate. Uh, to represent you all in Annapolis. And I, I currently run a, a successful local business, but the background includes uh, working in my community, serving my constituents. I chaired the local chamber of commerce. I chaired the economic development commission in Queen Anne's County. I served on the Maryland um, uh, chamber board and I served for the Maryland Association of Counties in Annapolis. And then I, and I serve as delegate uh, and I also served three years as a Queen Anne's County commissioner. And I was, I was commissioned president for those three years. Um, as the incumbent, I have a proven record of fiscal responsibility and accountability. I'll continue to work with my counties. We work for four counties and several municipalities. And I've done the job. I've worked hard to do the job. Um, I work as part of a team, Team 36, which consists of Delegate Jacobs, uh, Delegate Grice, and Senator Hershey and myself. Um, I've also served as the Deputy Minority Whip in my committee, which is the Economic Matters Committee. Um, and uh, 
Senator Hershey serves as a minority whip, so we're pretty much, a, and Dolly Greist is on the, uh, the um, Appropriations Committee, and he's our budget guy, and Delegate Jacobs is the uh, caucus chair. So we kind of covered it. We covered all the bases in Annapolis. Um, we're probably the most respected and effective team in Annapolis, the district, and we're doing well with that. Um, while serving, um, I've been proud to be, oh, I'm sorry, I, I can stick with some of the endorsements. I'm endorsed by uh, Governor Hogan. I'm endorsed by the NRA. I'm endorsed by uh, the Maryland Farm Bureau. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, we're going to be going into the audience questions now. And first, I'd like to review the, um, some of the guidelines. Um, so we're going to be asking you to come up to the microphone because this is being uh, recorded for the television. And before posing your question, please provide your name and um, where you live, and you'll get 45 seconds to pose your question. Um, and there are timers up here that will flag you if you go, go over that. And each of your questions, they can be um, posed to one or two candidates, all right? And then each of the candidates um, will have two minutes in order to respond. Um, we're asking that you do not use this as an opportunity to address a specific personal situation, but rather ask questions that you think are going to be of interest to the, the general voting public. And then also please refrain from providing um, your personal comments and opinions on the issues. Um, but because what we'd like to do this is keep it to a high level of civility um, and ensure that decorum is observed. So at this point, um, I'd like to ask anyone that's interested in asking questions to come up to the microphone and again, um, announce your name and location. Yep. And if you'd like to, you could form a little line you know, if there's one or two that are interested in talking. Good evening. My name's Roy Sherman. Uh, I live in Centerville. And... Um, you have to hold it up to you. I'm sorry? Okay, they were having a hard time hearing. Okay. That yeah. better? <laughs> okay. <laughs> sorry about that. My name is Royce Herman. I live in Centerville. Um, I have a two-part question. I'd like to pose it to Delegate Grace and candidate uh, Dudley. And it has to do, there's a lot of noise lately about uh, the minimum wage. I know there's a couple of candidates that are running on the Democratic side that are proposing to raise the minimum wage. And my question is, do you or do you not support a raise in the minimum wage to $15 and why? The second part of the question is, there's also some rumblings about guaranteed, uh, minim uh, guaranteed minimum income. <coughs> Same question, do you support it or do you not support that and why? Well, I, I, should I go first? Uh, probably substantially similar answers, but yeah, probably go ahead. More than likely, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I think, uh, uh, and this isn't the first time we've ever debated this issue. It seems like it's a discussion just about every year. Um, the uh, and the intentions are good, um, but unfortunately, I st very strongly believe that the unintended consequences are going to be f far greater than um, than the outcome um, by increase in um, folks' minimum wage. I, I do very strongly believe that the free market is the answer. Um, and the labor market's no different than the market for widgets or the market for uh, um, cheeseburgers or whatever it, whatever it might be. Um, the um, what we're going to end up seeing, I, I believe, is if wages go up uh, to fifteen dollars an hour, um, and, and it's it's going to hurt our district probably more so than any other. We're we're very service <coughs> oriented. Um, we. Um, we, we rely very strongly on, um, um, you know, services and, and, and not so much on manufacturing. Um, and so I think it's going to have a huge negative impact on, on our district. So I will absolutely fight um, any increases um, in the minimum wage. And then the s second part of that question was, like, income. for the same reasons. Um, yeah, I would certainly oppose, yeah, I would oppose that as well. Um, yeah, I, th I think I, I, I have faith, um, you know, our country is built on free markets. Our country was built on um, um, capitalism, and we are one of the, we are the strongest and the most uh, viable country in the entire world. I'm very, very proud of where we are uh, because of our free markets. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I 100% I agree with Delegate Grice. Uh, I'm a firm believer in the free market economy. This is 
primarily a big reason why I'm a Republican and not a Democrat. Uh, currently, our unemployment rate, I believe, is about 3.9 percent. It's very low. That's forcing wages to go up and matching or in going past uh, in the rate of inflation. Uh, so I don't see a, a need to raise minimum wage, especially considering we have states surrounding us uh, that have lower minimum wage. A lot of jobs are going to cross the border into Delaware, Virginia, Pennsylvania, wherever, if we raise minimum wage $15. That's going to hurt the very people that the minimum wage ra rising advocates are trying to help. Um, and as with the, what was it, the um, guaranteed minimum income? Yeah, similar reasoning. Um, I, I think that would also probably promote some laziness, which would de de depress our GDP, which is uh, tied in with our military and economic strength, soft or hard power. Some other countries, I think Canada's experimenting in Ontario and also a couple nations in Scandinavia. Let them experiment. Um, sit back, watch what happens. Maybe it'll be a disaster. Uh, maybe not. Um, I would sit back and wait and, and not act on that. I'm Jim Beecham, resident of the town of Centerville. The Maryland Department of Transportation is currently engaged in phase one of a study evaluating options for an additional Bay Bridge span. And I'd like to hear from any of you that are willing to weigh in what your preferred option is for a third span and what you think the least favorable option is. Could you pick two of the candidates? Pick two. Um, <laughs> Delegate Arrens and, um, and Jay. Um, my, I guess I can answer the, the second question. We, we see a lot about this uh, bridge. Uh, we, we go up to Kent County and we listen to stop the bridge at all costs. They don't want to come through there. We, um, there's a task force out there already. You know, we're doing the NEFA study currently to determine where would be the best place. And uh, you've seen some legislation this year that uh, kind of rebukes that, and they wanted to take the Eastern Shore out of it. Um, as far as where the next Bay Bridge should be, I think that's what the study's going to do. I know Kent County doesn't want it. I know that down south there's a lot of critical area. Um, there's a lot of uh, push, from what I hear, to put it current, where the current bridge is because we do have the infrastructure there. As a Queen Anne's County resident and somebody who has fought this battle in the past, that's a very difficult thing to, to pull on us with everything we're going through now. I think the reach the beach attitude we had several years ago kind of put us in a kind of a block, if you will, because if you try to go somewhere on a Sunday or, or Sunday afternoon or a Friday evening, you're kind of landlocked. Um, my personal opinion probably doesn't really matter where, where to you where it goes. I think that uh, we're going to make a decision based on all the counties. It's going to be a cumulative decision. Everybody's going to look into it. We're going to try to make the best decision with the best information possible. Um, I'm not sure that bridge will happen in my lifetime, which is sad to say. I do know that we continually suggest things to the Maryland Department of Transportation on how to free that bridge up and free the traffic. There's been suggestions about taking over some of the state roads for the county to block them off. That's kind of hard to do when we all pay taxes. So um, my personal preference, I guess the most logical place might be to keep it where it's at, but you're going to have to do a whole lot of work to appease Queen Anne's County and I'll probably work with the residents here to say that might not be such a good idea for us. Delegate? Okay. Um, maybe some of you have seen a few of the signs up in Kent County where I live. Uh, no bridge to Kent, so you kind of know where many of the Kent County residents sit on this issue. Uh, but I got to tell you that I do hear from, from uh, a few that are certainly in favor of a bridge coming over into Kent County. Um, you know, it would certainly change that county entirely. It would not look the same as it, as it has for, for 400 years. My concern is more about the infrastructure that we're working with now. You know, we've had several discussions over the past few years with the uh, Queen Anne's County Commissioners, very concerning as the uh, westbound congestion, uh, you know, it's, it's, it seems like it gets worse every, every year, every weekend. So my number one issue is more about the infrastructure, you know, building that so that, that we can back down on some of this congestion as then to where this next bridge may or may not occur. There's three options in the tier, you know, it's a tier one study now, but there's three options. There's a, you know, and the third option is a no build option. And certainly in my, my opinion is that we need to deal with the congestion and the, and the, and the bottlenecks that we have 
currently, especially in Queen Anne's County, because in January of 19, when the Route 1 bypass opens up, you're going to see a whole lot more traffic, and I, I believe a lot more truck traffic than we're seeing now. Um, they, the Delaware statistics are that it's minimal, but when it's a $35 toll difference between going north and going south, I think we pretty much know which way that these trucks are going to go. So the number one issue is the infrastructure. That's got to be fixed now. If you build a new bridge, it's going to take 20 years. And this study, not the tier one, but the tier two will zero in on where that may be. And every county on the Eastern Shore has one vote. I'd like to take a moment to answer that, please. Um, we're going to, no, I think we're still going Let's allow This is a very important issue. Okay. Thank you. All right, we'll provide then an opportunity for each of the candidates to respond on this one. If they want to. Yep, if you want to. Okay. Thank you. You know, when I, when I go around and I'm talking to people, um, I, hear, I hear about recalling a study that was done years ago by the Ehrlich administration that showed that the bridge was going to be <coughs> best suited out of uh, coming into Dorchester <coughs> County. So I would like to look at that a little further, and I'd like to find out myself why we're doing another study, spending millions of dollars, when we've already had one study that landed it uh, in Dorchester County. But one thing that, and, and, and by the way, um, I've met with... Um, with the State Highway Administration, with Commissioner Bucky, we came up with a solution to take, um, take those alternate routes off of, off of the Waze locator so when it's backed up, they're not being <coughs> routed directly through your neighborhoods to get back onto 50. Um, so we have taken that initiative and have also talked with SHA about having HOV in local lanes. But, you know, one thing that does concern me, this year there was a bill put in <laughs> by a delegate out of Anne Arundel County. Uh, it, was un it was not moved on favorably, but none of us heard about it. But there's a law in the state of Maryland that says that if you are going to receive a bridge, toll bridge, toll tunnel, or highway, you have a veto right. Your, your county has a veto vote. This bill was put forth that would strip all counties on Eastern Shore of their veto vote. Now, I don't know why none of us heard about that, um, but that's a little concerning to me because I think all of us have an opinion on it. And when it comes to taking our votes away, I think we have a, should have a very strong opinion about that as well. Um, so that's my answer. I think it should probably go down into Dorchester um, based on the public desire. And that was Delegate Malone that put that out. Actually, it was Senator Riley. Well, but, uh, from the House side, it was Malone. If I may answer, just briefly give an answer. I killed the House bill. There were two bills, the Senate bill and the House bill. Mm -hmm. House bill came into my committee, which I sit on the Transportation Subcommittee. And I actually killed that bill. So it was not <coughs> acted on. It was killed. But I was concerned we didn't know about it. That but was we, my point. Actually, we had input from the commissioners. So we did have input from that. So. All right. Would any of the other candidates like to respond to that? I'll just say briefly that I have a uh, over my dead body approach to a bridge <laughs> to Kent County. Thank you. <laughs> Most of them are loaded. Yeah. Right. We're fine. Question. Hi. Good evening. I'm Mark Kasha. I live on Kent Island. My question has to do with uh, representation on the federal level, uh, since we're Republicans here, and uh, I wanted to see what your opinion was on an Article 5 Convention of States, if you would support that or not, and why. And I'd like all of the delegates to answer that, since we started already broke the ice, if not just the three Queen Anne County uh, candidates. Are you directing that to anyone? Are you directing it to two candidates? Or? I'd like to d address it to all five to hear what their opinion is, but uh, at a minimum of three, of, uh, at least the Queen Anne's County part. I bet we'll do go with pick two, and then we'll see if anybody else would like to respond. All right. Okay. I'll start with Steve and Rick. How about that? How's that? Who? You and me. Well, you know, that, that uh, I get a lot of emails on that. Um, there are some issues with doing that. Uh, once you open something up, you open up Pandora's box. Uh, my personal opinion is I would lean towards, you know, some things need to be done. And if you're going to let that is, I'd rather let the people decide that and put it to us and, and get a population that's going to support something like that. Um, I do think there are dangers to the Constitution when you do that. And I think there are people that can come through and put in some subjective type legislation. Uh, I think some things do need to change. The world is changing. So um, would I support it? Uh, I'd really have to get a whole lot more emails. I'd probably get maybe 
three, four week, three, four month that I get talking to me about it, it's nothing that's really come up in the General Assembly for me to discuss. So it's I would take a little bit different approach. I would actually do some uh, more intellectual level study and I would dig in a little deeper and find out what are the issues because I agree with Delegate Aarons. You do open up Pandora's box and to a lot of potential negatives. So not only do you have to know your issues, but you have to know your audience and uh, it does require a, 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 a majority of the states to go and make any type of uh, uh, lasting decision, but again, it is Pandora's box and you have to calculate that risk before you open it. But my approach would be more um, of uh, a, a research approach um, at this point rather than public opinion. Um, I, I guess my question, could you, could you clarify, and I'm a little embarrassed to have to ask, but uh, is that just a, go ahead. Is that like just a, a rewriting of the U.S. Constitution? No, not to rewrite the Constitution, to uh, affect certain changes to get the immovable Congress and representation of that act back to the Republican and federal one. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I would agree with the, those who were speaking. I think that has kind of opened a bit of a Pandora's box. Some of the, I'll just weigh in on that very quickly. I know some of uh, the concern is the unintended consequences, again, um, at least from our conservative perspective. And I know that that was mentioned in the question. Um, it does require 38 states in order for it to pass. And I will say that um, if, it's, if it's something that um, is, is, doesn't have conservative principles, um, I can tell you that there aren't 38 states in the United States that will pass a constitutional um, any changes to the Constitution, but uh, I wouldn't support it in Maryland um, because I do believe that um, our Constitution has outlived, I think, any other Constitution in the history of the world, um, and it works. Um, it's one of the greatest documents ever written, um, and I, I know that um, change is good oftentimes, um, but it's written in such a way that our country can still change without changing the Constitution, um, and I don't see there any reason why there's a need um, for, for a constitutional convention. Oh, thank you. And to Delegate Grice's point, I would like to add that one of the strengths of our Constitution is that it is so old. I don't think any of us want to turn into one of these South American countries that have a new Constitution every 10 years. Uh, the Constitution is the bedrock of our American democracy. Its strength is in its resilience. We have the opportunity to amend bits of it if we like, and I think it would be better to go that route. Thank you. Good evening, gentlemen. I'm Kathy Magruder. I live in Centerville, Maryland. Tonight I'd like to ask you about bond bills. Every year we see millions of dollars of revenue go to various jurisdictions around the state for projects that are critical to those communities for improvements within those communities. I'd like to know, those of you that are incumbents, what kind of bond bill revenue projects have you brought funding to the region for? And those of you that are candidates for office, what kind of projects do you see that would be important to bring home bond bill revenue for our region. And I'd like to start with Delegate Grice and Delegate Arends. Well, thank you. And um, that's one of the responsibilities that I mentioned during the introduction. And that's one of the things that I take very seriously. I remember four years ago when we ran, there were um, several candidates who refused to put in bond bills, which completely boggled my mind. I didn't understand it. Um, because they're in the budget every year, and if, if we don't ask for the money, that money's going to go somewhere else in the state, and it usually goes to Baltimore City. It usually goes to Montgomery County. It usually goes to Prince George's County. Um, so so I, I, every year, um, I fought hard, um, and this year was a huge win um, for Compass Regional Hospice. Um, we were able to get a million dollars, actually, um, and that's, uh, it helps Kent, Queen Anne's, and Caroline County. Um, last year, um, I believe we got $250,000 um, for uh, the Benedictine School, um, which it, not only does it help, um, it, it's, it's in Caroline, um, but it serves the entire state. Um, in fact, uh, this coming Friday, I, I uh, will be receiving, um, and which I'm very proud of, an award from Ark of Maryland, um, which they do great work for uh, developmental disabilities. Um, and uh, part of that was uh, <coughs> was because of the bond bill, and I think part of it too was uh, reestablishing the, uh, the reimbursement rate um, for DDA, um, which that's something I'm very proud of, and we did that in my subcommittee. Um, we did uh, talisman um, therapeutic riding um, this year um, for Queen Anne's County, uh, Easter Seals in Kent County. Um, we did uh, a couple years ago a bond bill for uh, Singerly um, um, Fire Company um, up in uh, Elkton uh, for their helipad. 
Um, and these are all requests that are coming from the community, mostly from local government. And this is one thing that I, you know, this is my role, but it's, it's a team effort. Um, it, it's all four of us um, that get these bills passed. It's not just me on this committee, um, but it's something that, that we all work together on. And as a team, um, you know, we decide how we're going to approach um, getting these bills passed. And that's something we all take very, very seriously um, because um, a small amount of money, uh, just a couple thousand dollars, means an awful lot to our communities in District 36. Um, bond bills are kind of a unique animal. I, th I think uh, one thing we forget about bond bills is it's tax dollars. It's your tax dollars, and you're letting us make decisions on how to spend your tax dollars. Um, the intent of the bonds in many, many, many cases is phenomenally good. I mean, if you look at what we were able to do for Talisman, um, you look at what we were able to do for the hospice of Queen uh, of, of uh, the Chesapeake, those are excellent choices of how we're going to spend our money. You can see bond bills going to, um, they're, they're misused a lot in Annapolis. You can look at that, some, when I was on appropriations, we'd look at a bond bill that was still sitting out there, hadn't been used for three years because they weren't ready for it or what have you. I think uh, in the General Assembly we misuse them. I don't think we, we treat them with the, the appropriateness that we have to. I'm, I'm pretty pleased that we did get a lot of money here for Queen Anne's County this year. and. We get fought on over in the General Assembly when we're asking for these dollars because Queen Anne's County is relatively small. Our district is relatively small, but it's still a big, big enough district. Um, and again, as a fiscal conservative, they're real hard to give out. It's a little bit like me picking, like you said, me picking what I'm going to do with your tax dollars. Um, and would it, is there a better way? I, I'm not sure I know it. Would it be better if we were all self-sufficient? Yes, but that's not the reality of the world. So. Um, I'm, I'm proud to be part of the group that got these dollars for us. Uh, the way it was told to me early on was, if you don't take it, somebody else will, and that's a pretty bad way to run a world, I think. Uh, I, I work hard at it, I work to support it, and it, uh, it is something I think the state should really take a hard, a hard look at and review it. Um, a lot of people need, but is it really the state's job to fix those problems? That would be my question. Thank you. Okay, since this is an incumbent question, uh, I'd also like to add that for the first, my first term, my four, first four years, you know, we were <coughs> battling a recession during the O'Malley Ma administration, and uh, I would not put a bond bill in. The opening phrase in the bond bill starts with creation of state debt. That's the actual language of a bond bill, creation of state debt. And I wouldn't do it. And I never put a bond bill in two, until two years ago. It was a, the first time and Governor Hogan said I'd like for you guys to go ahead and participate in you know trying to get some of this bond money and we've done well I've always encouraged people to really do a, a, a line item in a capital budget it's it's much more effective it's it's really the more concise way to know what kind of money you're gonna get you can get that line item in the capital budget which we've been able to do several times I think the results are much better. Uh, you don't have to wait till the last day and hope that you get half of what you ask for. You almost know right up front on the capital line item that, that the money is, is really more direct. Um, you know, I, I've put bond bills in. We, we did well this year. I'm not a great lover of bond bills, um, but I do support the projects. I think Y River School, we, we got uh, one of our colleagues to put that bond bill in a few years ago, and they, they uh, did very well with, uh, with bond money. But the real, I think the, the best method is really a line item in capital budget, more so than a bond bill. Thank you. Bowers or Dudley? Sure. <clears throat> Again, it's important to understand that, as uh, the delegate said, the first words in that, in the verbiage, the first words in the bill is creation of state debt. Um, very big, very big consideration taking on additional debt on any level. Um, however, what I would, what I would be open to uh, would be bills that would address the situations that I'm hearing about when I knock on doors and when I talk to people in their home and in their businesses. They want relief from traffic, anything that will help traffic. Um, and as I mentioned to you, I've already been working to whatever level I can without being elected on those issues. <coughs> Um, the other thing would be education uh, for the trades in particular. Get our kids trained so they can do things and adults trained so they can do things that will produce a very good wage. 
uh, which might even off, or take a little pressure off the, the drive for this minimum wage that's supposed to somehow be a, a living wage and support a family, which in fact, minimum wage was never intended to meet that criteria. It was intended as a starting point. Um, also, I would, I would be open to bonds that would help us with intervention uh, on, with the opioid pr crisis. I think we're losing too many adults and too many uh, useful lives to um, addictions, to opioids, uh, for reasons that are both the person's fault and not necessarily the person's fault. You know, somebody slips their back, they're in the hospital for a week, pain meds for the next two weeks recovering, and then they can't stop. Um, so, yeah, I would, I would be cautiously open to creating uh, a bond uh, that would touch on any of those three issues. I, I, th I think it's mostly been said. I'll just add that bonds should be used judiciously. Judiciously. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any more questions from the audience? Okay. Come on up. Mm -hmm. Again, Roy Sherman, Centerville. And this question is something that's near and dear to my heart. That's alcohol and the gasoline. Uh, there's 55,000 classic cars in Maryland according to the DMV. And 12% alcohol and fuel is incredibly destructive to a carbureted vehicle. Is there any way we can get, at least get an alternative? I know if, we, if I went to Caroline County, I can get alcohol-free fuel. I cannot get it in Queen Anne's. And a lot of technical evidence that says that's kind of a, kind of a silly thing. To be honest with you, if you go to the handbook of chemistry and physics, you're going to see that uh, the amount of alcohol necessary. Do you support it? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Delegate Aarons and uh, <laughs> candidate Bowers. I, I guess it's, it's really a local issue more than it is a state issue with what we're going to allow. Um, of course I support it. I think free enterprise is free enterprise. Um, I think there's restrictions on, on the different types of fuel, like you can buy farm fuel and what have you in, in Queen Anne's County and farms. You don't necessarily buy that same stuff up in uh, Baltimore City. Um, well, I never really thought about getting that type of fuel and what it's doing. Uh, I, I run too much gas through my truck already, so I think it's really kind of an not relevant to my situation. Um, I, w I would suggest you bring something at the local level to get them to come up to support us, walk over to us, and typically what we do is we, we get uh, the, the commissioners to come up with a recommendation. We'll take that into get a bill written towards it and find out what we got to do to get it pushed through. Um, I, I don't personally have a problem with it. I don't, uh, I don't really deal in it enough to really give you a, this is the dynamics of what a chemistry does to the engine or what it does, but it, it kind of makes sense. I do know that when I put fuel in my boat and I don't run my boat that year, it gets kind of bad the next year, so it's, it's mm -hmm. not necessarily the best thing for my vehicle. Um, but the EPA has things. I mean, we have to be conscious of the environment and we have to be conscious of why that bill, why that type of fuel is out there and what the purpose is in the end. So I'll be fine with it. Yeah, uh, I agree with most everything said. <clears throat> it does create a problem for people who own nice vehicles and uh, you know, they're of a certain era uh, and they just don't, they're just not compatible with that, with that uh, fuel that is available now. Um, I, would, I would actually, if it's just a matter of, of um, if it's available, you say it's available in Caroline County but not in Queen Anne's County. So, you know, I guess what I would be inclined to do is take the lead on it and uh, go directly to the commissioners and ask them why they, um, they've taken the stance. If They may not even be aware of it, and they may be very open to it. And, um, but I would be supportive of anything that would help the classic car owners keep their cars. I've heard the things, same thing about boats. So uh, I, I don't see any reason to oppose it. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I might take an opportunity, since no one's standing right up at the mic, to ask a quick question. Um, Gwen Schultz from Ken Island. And if you are elected, is there one issue that you feel so passionate about that during the upcoming legislative session you would personally want to champion? And why don't we just go um, maybe to our, um, the two folks who are not the incumbents, <coughs> Ms. Dudley and Bowers, and then our incumbents who <coughs> are interested in answering that. 
Um, thank you for the question. I would say I could probably die a happy man if I could get rid of partisan gerrymandering. Um, I think it's absolutely atrocious, the fact that that's considered permissible. This is supposed to be a, rep a representative democracy. Um, this is something I've studied extensively in law school. If anyone would like a very dense 40-page scholarly article on the subject, please raise your hand and I can send you a PDF this evening. Um, it's just outrageous. Uh, it's the reason why we only have one Republican in Congress from the state, despite having eight, eight seats. Um, and it's the reason why sometimes the, Repub the Republicans, quite frankly, benefit it nationally. We should get away from it. Both parties would be better off without it. And that's something I would really like to tackle at the state level and get, getting rid of. Thank you. Thank you. Would you mind repeating that very quickly? Right. If elected, is there an issue that you feel so passionate about that during this upcoming legislative session, you would want to personally serve as, as a champion on that okay. issue? <clears throat> Actually, there are two. Uh, one is education. As I mentioned earlier, I'm tired of seeing our children raised here move away because there's no work here. Um, I'm also tired of children being shamed, virtually shamed into feeling like they need to go to college if they're going to be successful in life. College is not necessary for everyone. Some people simply are not cut out for it. They have no interest in it. Uh, thankfully, enough people do have interest, uh, but I would not, I, I would lean more toward creating trades and um, uh, uh, um, opportunities for our, our young people to, to grow in them. The other thing that um, I'm passionate about is the opioid crisis. We need to do something about the opioids. And my experience as a pastor, I've had hands-on experience with addicts. I've had addicts in my home. I have seen them through the recovery, and I've presided over their funerals. So I have had much experience with it, and it is in my heart to make sure that if I have anything to do with it, no one is going to die of op an opioid addiction if I can help it. Thank you. Thank you. My turn. Um, hands down, drugs. Um, drugs and the, the problems with drugs in our country today they affect so many facets. They affect not only our businesses, they affect our families, they affect our children, they affect everything we do. They affect the way our economy is running. You look at how we're fighting and doing things to enable drugs to people. We've, we've legalized medical marijuana. We're talking about legalizing marijuana. We're talking about doing all these things, but these are all things that are destroying our youths. I mean, we watch suicides. Uh, I introduced some software to Queen Anne's County it's text to stop it. It's a piece of software that kids can now anonymously sit back and say, hey, you know what, Bobby Jones is over here using, he's, he's selling marijuana in the, in the thing, in the bathroom. You need to come in here. It's going to save me from being, being the victim then by telling, call, telling on somebody what they're doing. But we also look at the devastation of drugs. When somebody gets hooked on something, it doesn't just affect that person. It affects their family. If you have a child that's been uh, addicted to a drug, if you have a child that's been been actually destroyed by the drug and uh, possibly a child that committed suicide because of drugs. If we're not making this our biggest priority, I mean, there are other things in this state I'm sure we need. I could go into health care, mental health, look at the mental health issues. You have to sit back and define whether mental health happens before you start drugs or after you start drugs. Where, when, do we, when are we mentally ill? And to watch the devastation, to look at our youths today and watch the lack of accountability because of these types of things, it's just, it's atrocious. I think if there were one issue we could solve today, I think that would be my, my, my front runner. Um, do we have other social issues? We have, we have business issues. We have health care. If you look at health care, which parlays right into that, health care costs are going through the roof because of these drugs. So this thing affects so many parts of our business and so many parts of our country and so many parts of our families. Um, I've seen it. I've watched it. I've seen the child who's died mm -hmm. from it. Um, and it's just, it's just not pleasant. It's just not fun. And that software I'm talking about in Queen Anne's County has actually saved lives. It's prevented suicides. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Mm -hmm. Here. Um, what I probably failed to mention when I began talking tonight was I founded and chaired the Commercial Waterman's Caucus. So I'm the go-to guy on that kind of legislation, Waterman uh, legislation, and we have a great deal of that industry in this district. Uh, specifically Kent and Queen Anne's County and I put bills in for both associations on many occasions also in agriculture uh, passed a couple bills this past year that were really opened the doors on some uh, some opportunities some value-added opportunities for agriculture in the district um, 
you know, certainly what my colleagues have been talking about are very concerning to me. But if you look at my, the bills that I've put in over my career, they, they're broad. They're all over whatever is the concerns, the major concerns of the district. You know, I was the first one to really start talking about the Conowingo Dam eight years ago when the Chesapeake Bay Foundation downplayed the whole issue. And now you see it at the forefront. And to compound that problem, we have a habitual leak at Baltimore, the Baltimore City sewerage, which we've had in Kent County, high bacteria counts this past week off the chart that are obviously coming from these leaks, constant leaks coming out of Baltimore City. So legislation needs to keep addressing these issues that are affecting each one of us. It starts at the top of this bay and runs down the, to the bottom. And, and you know, the bay is the centerpiece of, of what we are here in this district. And, um, you know, I'm certainly passionate about those issues, but certainly open to uh, whatever the issue is that my constituents feel that is important to them as well. Good, thank you. Yeah, we talk a lot about um, the legislative session, and we do a lot of work um, during uh, those 90 days. Um, but most of our success stories, it happens during the interim. Um, it's about building relationships, not just with our local community, but it's also about building relationships with other legislators, um, you know, legislative leadership. Um, and for us, um, most of our success stories actually comes from um, Governor Hogan's administration. Um, it comes from the secretaries. It comes from all of the departments. Um, and one of the biggest <coughs> challenges um, that I focused on, not um, just as a, as a delegate, but also as a county commissioner for, for eight years, um, and that's been uh, economic growth. Um, and right now, um, there's a huge effort in Annapolis and in other states where we just want to, you know, we want to pro provide a uh, an opportunity. You know, we we give a lot of tax incentives, we give a lot of money, we give a lot of this, we give a lot of that to bring big companies in, but. I, you know, we can try all these things, um, but we don't have to on the Eastern Shore. Um, we have good businesses on the Eastern Shore right now who are screaming for good qualified help. And at the same time, we have people who are leaving our communities and working over on the Western Shore. Um, and the reason is, is because we have a huge uh, workforce shortage. Uh, we have a workforce training shortage. Um, and I started this as a county commissioner, um, and I'll continue doing this. And it's not just during legislation, um, legislative session to be all year. Um, we're going to uh, we started getting, um, several years ago, working with our school superintendents and our local government. Um, and, and what I want to do um, this fall when school um, is back into session is uh, do a field trip to uh, Washington County. Uh, they have a regional vocational school there, um, and it works. Um, and you would be amazed by uh, what they're doing. I mean, advanced robotics. I mean, they're doing things that um, you'll, you'll see college students at MIT or uh, Virginia Tech that are doing. Um, I want to bring that to the Eastern Shore. I want to fill these jobs on the Eastern Shore. I mean, we, we can expand our economy without giving away the farm um, to, to the Amazons and, and um, those, those companies that are, uh, that are out there. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Cheryl Jarrows from Queen Anne County, and I'd like to hear from all of y'all on your stance of concealed carry here in Maryland. Thank you. Pick the first two that you want to Oh, uh, well, Queen Anne's, Steve Ernst and Rick Bowers. I didn't hear the question, I'm sorry. I'd like to have your opinion on concealed carry for Maryland residents. I support the second one. I was just endorsed by the NRA with an A rating, so I support concealed carry. Uh, what more can I say about it? Uh, I think that uh, we're, we're far too often punishing the law-abiding citizens for what they do. We sit back and we see something happen because somebody who doesn't obey the laws does something, he does it off kilter, and we go right after the person who's following the rules. Um, bottom line is support the Second Amendment. I would support concealed carry. I think Maryland is probably doing more than enough to, to argue that point. I think the restrictions they put on some people, I've had people in my office who could teach the course that were denied to concealed carry. So I support concealed carry. I too support concealed carry. I support the Second Amendment. I believe that it shall not be infringed upon and uh, I think that it's the protector of all of our other rights. Um, you know, I, I echo, echo what uh, the delegate said, and uh, if you choose to send me to Annapolis, I will defend your Second Amendment rights. Constitutionally, they are given to us, and as 
Uh, Mr. Dudley said about the bridge in Kent, it's an over my dead body type of thing for me. So I support concealed carry. Um, yeah, and yeah, specifically, I think Maryland has a, it's a pretty high bar to get a concealed carry permit. You can get one, but you essentially have to show that there's an imminent threat to your, to your bodily, to your body. Um, and I think you get a two year permit initially. And then after that, it's a one year and you have to continue to show that high bar. Um, and it's virtually impossible to get renewed. And I know spending time in Baltimore the last few years, getting my law degree and, and dealing with police officers, like what's been said, the, the good guys can't get a concealed carry permit and the bad guys don't bother to go get one. Um, so I think it should be made a little easier to do so. Thank you. What's um, very interesting is, um, you know, just reading articles, and I'm sure that um, a lot of you guys probably have seen it, um, where London now has a higher murder rate um, than New York City. And England has one of the highest, uh, um, most restrictive gun laws anywhere in the world. And people are being killed by knives. And so now the discussion in, in London and in England is knife control, which is very, very interesting. Um, and so I think that, that just, uh, that's a testament to the fact that uh, there is no correlation between very restrictive gun laws and murder rates. Um, and uh, for us, I can tell you that our Republican caucus um, in both the House and the Senate, we do a great job um, trying to uh, whittle back um, our Second Amendment rights. Every year we have bills um, that we're all putting in. Each one of us, we're, we're co-sponsors on these bills. Uh, unfortunately, um, we do live in the uh, Socialist uh, Republic of Maryland, and it's very, very difficult for, for us to get these bills through um, each and every year. Um, we've, we've had a few success stories, um, but it's nothing that we can, we can really take home and, and brag about, unfortunately. I wish we could. Um, but uh, yeah, concealed carry, um, you know, like, like you said, you, you can get it in Maryland, um, but it's progressive. It's just too, ex it's so expensive and it's nearly impossible to get, but we're trying. Uh, we try every single year. Um, and again, um, like um, Delegate Aarons and Delegate Jacobson, uh, Senator Hershey, we all do have an A rating with the NRA and we were actually endorsed by the NRA as well. Um, and they made that endorsement today. Thank you. I, I also support the concealed carry. Uh, issue uh, you know I was hoping that this year the federal government would act on the reciprocity uh, con conditions and, and uh, they failed to do so but you know the bar is set so high in Maryland uh, the conditions in the bar is way too high certainly you know what we hear from our constituents and it every year I've been there is this reciprocity issue of you know if I can carry and this state, why can't I carry in Maryland? And that's always the question. So I think it's one that uh, hopefully we'll reach uh, consensus on very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, gentlemen. Steve Donovan from Centerville. I thought I'd throw a softball at the end here since I heard about records, and records are what matter. So it's probably to these three guys here. Last calendar year, your personal success, what made you feel best about what you accomplished? One thing. Graduating from law school. <laughs> I'd like to give you a list of things if I could. Um, first is um, the committee work. Um, I mean, that's where things get done. And it's not the bills that I passed in the Appropriations Committee. It's the bills that we were able to, to water down or the bills that we were able to kill. And for me, um, one of the <clears throat> big concerns I have for the state of Maryland, and we talked about debt earlier, and it's not bond bills. Um, our, are the amount of, that we have in our capital budget is over a billion dollars now, and, and bond bills is only 10 million of that billion dollars. Um, what I'm worried about isn't Governor Hogan. He's been probably, arguably, the, the, the most fiscally conservative governor in the history of Maryland. Um, what I'm worried about are the other legislators who are putting all these bills in year after year after year who are uh, mandating more and more and more spending. Um, and man, I, I can tell you there's only six Republicans on the Appropriations Committee. And, and uh, really, there's only a couple of us who, uh, who read every single line of every single bill, and, and we're prepared to go to, to battle um, with some of these bills that are spending money on things that just, f at least for us and from our perspective, it's taking, a mo it's taking money away from hardworking Marylanders and, and giving it to special interests or giving it just as a small part of the population. These projects, to, to us, they just don't seem like they're very important at all. And, and, and for me, that's probably the biggest thing. And also, I had a couple mental health bills in. Uh, this year that will make a difference. Um, 
in the long run, especially for, for children who are, uh, who are having a hard time with access to care, um, especially in our district. I'm very, very proud of, of, of those bills. And, um, and uh, man, there's just, there, there are a lot of wins. Um, I mean, they're, they're, it's, this was a good session, not just for me, but, but for our team. Um, yep, thank you. I agree. Uh, <clears throat> this year was a great year for the entire team. Uh, for me personally, it was the best year I ever had. I uh, put in eight legislative bills and two bond bills, passed seven out of ten through the House and the Senate, and that's a pretty good number, usually about 20 percent if you're lucky. So I had a very successful year. I'm also the ranking member on my committee, and not only was I successful in my legislation, but I helped salvage a lot of bills from my colleagues that were important bills, bills that weren't going to make it. But my presence in the back room with all the subcommittee chairs, I was able to actually move some stuff that would have been killed, that really needed to be passed, that were really important to agriculture especially. Uh, I can think of those. And uh, uh, to the city of Crisfield, golf carts running up and down the highway. You know, that was a bill that the, the city of Crisfield really needed and that would not have gotten out of there you know, if I hadn't been sitting in that back room. So there, there's a lot of success. I, I mean, I had a great year. It is such a privilege to be in my position to be a representative for District 36 in the House of Delegates. I can't tell you. I wake up a lot of mornings and have to squeeze myself, you know. <laughs> but that, I, I had a great, the best year I ever had in eight years this year. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think this is kind of comical how we're both all focusing. Um, I sit on the Economic Matters Committee. I'm the business guy. I have to sit back there, and because I've owned a business, I truly am one of four members on my committee that actually signed the front of a check for anything other than my personal expenses. And beating bills and hammering bills, like the, the minimum wage bill you talked about earlier, we had Baltimore City come in and tell us why they needed that bill, why they needed that bill. Obvious question to the president up there was, Jack, how come Baltimore approved this for Baltimore last year? You've had the ability to implement it. Why didn't you implement it? He says, well, we can't do it alone. We'd lose all our businesses. <laughs> so we get to sit down there and we really fight these bills. We get to beat these bills down. That doesn't mean we win the bill. That doesn't mean we defeat the bill. But we put so many amendments on in committee and subcommittee. And that's where the real work is done. And I think Governor Hogan put it right. This is the best year he's had. This is the best year in, leg in the legislature for Republicans because we were able to sit back and bring a common sense approach to a lot of the bills that are damaging the state. We've been able to pull back regulations that are just crippling businesses. If you look at some of the, the, the problems we put on the business, you look at health care. We've raised health care costs exponentially. A small business now, when you talk about raising their rates, they got rate bumped up by 60 percent. When you brought the question to the state, and this is a big problem we all have, I sit back and say, well, what about the state? If this is going to affect a small business and those rates are going up, what's it going to do to the state that provides insurance? Oh, no, it doesn't affect us. So it goes back to the old saying when you talk about the federal government, why don't you give us the insurance you get? Why aren't we doing that for people? It's disingenuous for us as, as legislators to sit back here and act that way. And you start looking at some of the other bills. You, we focus on so many minute little areas. We focus on our farms and the damage they're doing to the Bay. But up until the last year, the Conowingo has not even been on the radar of some of these environmental groups we got to pound on that we got to support that we look at eight million gallons of of human f whatever it was came out of baltimore but we don't care about that we want to go beat up a farmer and we want to take away from them and put regulations on them so i think if we can address those things and we can keep hitting on those things and making them less thank you <laughs> stop okay are there any more questions i got one. Oh, one up Uh, Jack Wilson, Centerville, Maryland. Um, based on the federal tax cuts, the state of Maryland will receive a rather large windfall next year, some estimates uh, half a billion dollars. I'd like to hear from all five of you, because it's quite a large sum, of how you propose to, or what you propose to do with that money, whether tax cuts back to the citizens, education funding, roads. Thank you. Why don't we start? I'll start with that. Well, that decision has already been made by the leadership of the uh, Maryland House of Delegates and the, and the Senate. Um, <laughs> um, you're right. It's 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 five hundred million dollars. Um, the um, they gave about a hundred million dollars back in uh, tax credits to businesses. Um, another hundred million dollars they gave back to uh, the residents of, of the state of Maryland. Um, they kept another hundred million dollars uh, just as a uh, sort of a. Uh, um, 
sort of a contingency fund just in case their, uh, their revenue estimates are off. Um, and then they spent the rest. Um, majority of that did go to education. Um, but uh, they, what we tried, all of us um, in the Republican caucus, we had several bills in. Um, we, and the governor uh, as well had a bill in um, who where we tried several different ways to give all that money back to the residents of the state of Maryland. Um, because it's the reason why they, we had that $500 million windfall is because when he did the federal tax cuts, and this was a great decision that President Trump did and a great decision that, that uh, Congress made. Um, because we're seeing the economic stimulus right now already because of it. Um, the problem is that $500 million um, to, to um, debt to the, to the state of Maryland is because our, tax, uh, our taxes are already so high in Maryland. And we couldn't, I hate to go, I don't want to go into all the details because I don't have enough time to be able to do that. Um, but we're paying, we're paying that $500 million because we're one of the highest tax states in the country and we can't deduct those taxes when our federal returns anymore um, because most people are instead of itemizing they're going to be using the standard deduction so if it wasn't for the fact that we had 40 tax cuts over the, Hogan's previous eight before Hogan was in there and the fact that um, you know uh, the Montgomery counties and the Howard counties and and um, the uh, Baltimore counties aren't, aren't the, already the highest tax counties in the entire country um, the state of Maryland wouldn't be in this position to begin with um, and to be quite honest the residents in our district, um, we're going to be we're going to be held harmless from it anyway because we we are, a lot of our local tax rates are already low enough where we're not really going to see that impact. Um, it's only going to be mainly the, the waterfront property owners. Okay, um, you know if you recall the beginning of the session last year, conversations all over the news, all over everywhere was the whole hold uh, Marylanders harmless. They were going to return the windfall to the to the taxpayers. And guess what happens when you put half a million dollars in front of a bunch of politicians? <laughs> <laughs> it was a fight on our part to get any money back to the people. Because once you got all that big pot of money and a million areas to spread it, you know, that, that whole beginning rhetoric went out the window. And... Um, it's very concerning to us because that's what we heard. Every, that was a, across the board what everybody wanted was that windfall to go be spread across Maryland. And, um, you know, it's con it was concerning to us. I know there were, that our colleagues had a lot of bills in, many bills in, trying to deal with income tax rates and, and other issues that, uh, you know, would have been helpful as well. But, uh, like I said, when you put a put a carrot in front of a rabbit you know what's going to happen so thank you it, it, it it's very very difficult but as my colleague said here um, Maryland's tax structure was not meant to be supportive of that tax cut uh, sadly when we got that bill when we were looking at that we put more amendments on there tried to put more amendments on tried to steer that money over to things like opioid crisis is protecting our schools um, going back more and more to education and, and we're getting hit by questions like it's really something we did wrong and I think Delegate Grice mentioned it Maryland's tax laws Maryland's tax rates are so out of kilter you know think about when O'Malley was in office 40 tax increases in, in, in those years 40 taxes increases in fees that's very difficult for a governor like Hogan who came in who's very conservative and he's he's been very lucky we built our businesses we built our base and, and Maryland seems to be withstanding it but it's hard to decisions that have been made it's a very tough environment for us as legislators because when you start looking at the dollars and cents it's incredible to me where people can spend money and how they want to address it you know we start looking at some of the special interest groups in the in the counties and how they're going to spend it over there um, as, as as Republicans we inherently vote against those types of bills would like to see the money come back to the people Lord knows we all pay enough in taxes we spend enough in taxes and and everybody at least in Queen Anne's County I always get the question what am I getting for my tax dollar I still got to pick up my trash I still got to mow my lawn I still got to uh, shovel my driveway and some of my streets aren't even maintained and you sit down as we have the privilege to live here and thankfully in Queen Anne's County like I said we have one of the lowest tax rates in the state so that's a good thing 
but it's a very tough thing for us to watch in Annapolis. It's something we as a group fight against. Uh, we try to put uh, amendments on bills that make sense to us, common sense amendments, and they resoundingly get defeated. Um, with, a, with a majority sitting up there at 91 to, 40, uh, to 50, it's very, very difficult, but we do make our presence heard, we do make our amendments, and we try to make them so people understand that these have, you know, every vote has a, has a consequence. Thank you. Um, Mr. Bowers, would you like to respond to that? I'll defer. Okay, Mr. Dudley. Okay. Um, I think it's mostly been said. Uh, I will just say that currently under the new federal tax law, any amount of money of state taxes above $10,000 can no longer be deducted. That's really what's hurting Maryland, what's been discussed, is that we have a higher tax rate, so it's hurting more of our citizens. That is a very high bar to pass, and not many of us are paying enough taxes to get past that $10,000 threshold to begin with. Problem is, the people that do pay it are some of our largest, like the members that create the largest tax base and the most revenue for our state that pay for our services. Um, and you know, it's no surprise a lot of these folks are leaving in droves to, to low tax states. I would propose lowering the tax rate above that $10,000 threshold to keep some of these high tax paying citizens in the, in the state of Maryland. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Up. Yep. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, Steve Pringle from uh, Kent Island, Queen Anne's County. Um, how would you respond to legislation uh, put forth um, suggesting Maryland become a sanctuary state? And um, what I see some grins there. And uh, what, what laws do you think currently need to be addressed uh, regarding immigration? Is it in regards to Maryland? Can we pick a couple to start with here? Oh. Uh, let's go with uh, Delegate Greist and uh, Delegate um, Delegate Ernst, please. Thank you. Yeah, you probably saw me saw me smile. Um, yeah, our immigration. I mean, they're federal laws. Um, I mean, we already have federal laws on the books, um, and it's uh, honestly, I, I very strongly believe that um, whenever we have laws on the books, we should enforce them. Um, and I think it's the responsibility of both the federal, state, and local government to enforce federal, state, and local laws. Um, you know, if, if we have a problem um, with our immigration laws, then we should probably contact our federal senators. We should probably contact our congressmen um, in order to change those federal laws. Um, but that's not the discussion. The discussion is, is whether or not we want to enforce those laws. Um, and for me, um, I very strongly, again, I very strongly believe in, in, in enforcing um, the laws that are on the books, and if we don't like them, we should change them. Um, and that should be the discussion. Um, and um, you know, we're legislators. Um, our role is to uh, to take a look at state law. Um, and I don't think we have any business weighing in on immigration law. Uh, I don't think local government has any business weighing in on immigration law. Our business isn't enforcing the law um, in the executive branch, but our job is looking at state law. Um, and uh, right now, um, you know, that, that discussion should be, should be had um, in Washington, D.C. Yeah, thank you. No? Okay. Um, I do not support the sanctuary state. I don't support sanctuary counties. I don't support sanctuary cities. Um, you know, I'm putting Annapolis to look at the people. I'm putting Annapolis to take a look at my citizens and the taxpayers that are over here today and what, what they're actually doing and what they're trying to do for their families. We all sit back and we listen to stories about, I don't have enough money for this, I don't have enough money for that. And we all go back and say, well, where is all the money going? Um, I believe there is a process in this country. There, there's always been a process to come into our country. Um, I'm sure one of my grandparents followed it or great-grandparents followed it. And I don't know why we have to circumvent that. People use, well, we can't get labor. Well, you know, we do have a large <laughs> unemployment pocket in a lot of areas that just will work or will not work. Um, I believe that we've got to take care of Americans first. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not uncompassionate about it, but I just think it's, it's a hard line. And if you put laws in effect, I think you need to uphold the laws. You know, if you're going to give me rules, we have to play by the rules. Uh, dollars and cents mean a lot, and it shouldn't be heartless. We do enough. We do plenty when we go overseas. We always, if you ever look at the United States, is the first to address any country in need or in trouble in any circumstance. Um, it's just not something I think that is inherently good for the country. And I think Delegate Grice said, if, if this doesn't work for a lot of us, then we really do need to make changes in our laws. And we do need to uphold the current laws we have. Thank you. Thank you. Any other candidates here? Sure. 
I, uh, I agree. We need to enforce the laws on the books. Um, and we need, to, um, we need to begin to protect our own interests. You know, our president says we're going to have America's interests first. And I think that we as citizens need to begin to look at um, making decisions based on what's going to be best for us. Because when we lose, when we get to a certain point of, of depletion, <coughs> we'll no longer have anything to hand to anyone else in need. And uh, so we do have to protect our own interests. And I do believe that if we enforce the laws on the books, we can do it with compassion, but we can do it with precision, and uh, we, can, we can continue this great experiment that we call America as a melting pot. You know, for many years, we had no immigration at all. Um, and, and that's the process of becoming the melting pot. You see, melting is a process. It, it takes a little time. That, that, those, the, that era without immigration allowed the melting to occur. Now we kind of look a little bit more like a chopped salad. You know, I mean, everybody's in the same plate, but there's just, we're not melting together because people have brought their own uh, culture here and, 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 and we have allowed um, ourselves to, to um, lose our American identity to some degree because we are, um, we are simply not enforcing the rules that are inherently part of America. So I have no problem with immigrants, my family as well. Uh, came over here legally, but I do have a problem with, with rule breakers, and so that's my position on that. Um, um, yeah, in, in a word, no to the sanctuary state question. Um, it is slightly more nuanced, or the answer needs to be more nuanced than simply saying no immigration. You know, we've got farmers and crab pickers who can't get enough, enough guys or girls to, to go work for them. That's why Andy Harris, our congressman, was down, I think, in Dorchester County trying to beef up the number of H-2B visas just this year. Uh, for, for crab pickers down there because crabs are rotting and no one's there to pick it. Um, we need to probably have a smart employment uh, way to management so folks in, in ICE and elsewhere, they can know when people have overstayed their visa. Uh, it should be legal, um, but for better or worse, I look at things in a free market approach. We, we've got our fertility rate is the lowest it's been in our nation's history. If we're not careful, our population is going to start to decrease and not increase. It's because of immigration that we grow. Um, and moving forward, we're going to need that population increase, so we're going to continue, or not continue, but we will begin to decline as a country the way that Japan has. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question or not, but sanctuary state, no. Mr. Jacobs, would you like to answer that? Yes. Um, I think the question was about uh, sanctuary state. Is that, isn't that correct? Uh, I'm opposed to uh, Maryland being a sanctuary state. I think that most of what's been said pretty much will cover uh, you know following the law I think I don't think you can pick and choose law it is and where it isn't and uh, I used to when I was a mayor I used to tell the council I said you got to be consistent I don't care what you do you got to be consistent you can't be good here and not so good over here you got to be consistent and and uh, you know I think the laws are, are there if, if if they're not adequate, then you know they need to be addressed at the federal level. We're we're here to enforce Maryland law, and uh, and federal law that is that dictates you know a lot of our policy. Illegal immigration costs this state well over two billion dollars a year in various services that are provided. I'm not at all opposed to immigration. Certainly, I wouldn't be sitting here today if it wasn't for immigration. But. Uh, you know there are laws to be followed I don't want to be redundant but um, you know we need to follow the law and uh, if it's not correct then we need to make some changes thank you okay thank you okay this will be our last question for this evening thank you gentlemen okay. so if you who are incumbents are elected for another term and those of you that are looking to be elected for the first time get that opportunity <coughs> in that period of time what would you like to accomplish in a positive way for this region of the state that would make a difference for your constituents here? Um, how about, well, why don't I, I'll pick somebody. <laughs> why don't we go from the right to the left, Mr. Dudley and then Mr. Bowers and go around the corner there. <coughs> okay. uh, just briefly, I would like to make sure that the uh, hospital we have up in Chestertown remains open and fully funded. Uh, we definitely don't need this area to have less health care services. If that hospital goes away, um, you know, if you're down in Rock Hall, you're looking to drive in 50, 100 or more miles to get help. 
Um, so I would fight hard to keep that hospital open. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've already touched on what's important to me and what I'd like to try to take care of as a legislator, as your legislator in Annapolis. Um, I would take the lead as much as possible on the traffic situation, working with local, state, and if necessary, federal authorities to make things happen. Uh, secondly, education. Uh, not only would I like to implement some trade education, but I'd like to also make sure that our children are getting the fundamental education that is necessary for them to be successful contributors to our society long term. And again, I mentioned the opioids. You know, as I said earlier, I have seen people through to recovery and I've presided over their funerals. And I'll tell you, I like the recovery much better. It is possible. It takes a group effort. And I think that my skills, my background as a pastor, uh, affords me the ability to work within the faith communities, which I think we'd all agree are necessary in this, um, in this function, along with local and state law enforcement and uh, the community in general, along with businesses, need to be involved in taking care of this problem because it does affect all of us, whether it's a relative, a worker, a neighbor, we're all affected by it, and we have to simply take an all of the above approach on it. And I believe that my skills and my experience are best suited to, uh, to uh, see that through. Thank you. I would probably have to agree with the, the health care. I think my experience and what I've been able to accomplish, um, we are, my district consists of the only two counties in the state of Maryland that does not have a hospital. Um, back in the early days, I was instrumental in getting us as part of the certificate of need process for the hospital down in, in uh, Easton. Um, I've been a part of trying to save the hospital up in uh, Chestertown. One of the things that we are lacking in this area are those, those things. Our, our population, if you look at the needs up in, in Kent County itself, the population is aging just like we are down here in Queen Anne's and addressing those types of needs. We brought uh, additional services into Queen Anne's County for people with diabetes and heart disease and what have you. Um, I was a strong supporter of the cardiac center going over into Anne Arundel Medical Center to where they just got, and again, they got the approval. It may be uh, uh, appealed again, but it's still something that we've been very effective at, at approaching. And I think that ties into the other thing that I mentioned is my primary need. We, we do have an epidemic and we do need to address it. First and foremost, uh, is a traffic a problem? Yes, traffic is a problem on Fridays and Sundays, but opioids are a problem Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And we're not doing enough. We're allowing things to happen. Do you know that if a, a person overdoses and I call somebody, if I'm with a drug addict and he's overdosing, no one gets charged for that crime. No one. That person gets, they're exempt from being, being arrested or their paraphernalia may be confiscated, their drugs may be confiscated, but there's no ramifications for overdosing. And we even have people that are overdosing that are actually fighting the Narcan we give them. The cost of trying to bring these people back, the Narcan, doesn't get reimbursed by the person that used it. If you get a prescription, you have to pay for that prescription. I think um, the healthcare side of it, the drug side of it, is probably where I think I can make the most difference in Queen Anne's County and my district. Thank you. All right. Um, I wrote some notes. They have really good notes. Uh, <laughs> you know, one of the things that, that has really affected our district is when the re recent recession hit the shore it has it has really been tough and very very slow to recover there are counties uh, in our district that are very slow to recover we always ask me what's the biggest hurdle i said we you know we i mean the entire district borders t tax free delaware and it's one of the biggest problems we have we lose a lot of business to delaware people shopping in delaware you know, it's made our economy move move certainly uh, back to to us where it was. Hopefully, it won't be much longer getting there. But it's been a very, very, very slow recovery from the recent recession. Um, we got enormous transportation issues, getting people around. I served on the uh, Rural Health Care Commission along with Senator Hershey. Uh, you know, trying to keep. The uh, hospital in Chestertown, the, the uh, inpatient services present and, and no reduction in services. But what keeps coming back are the transport transportation challenges in our district, you know, all over our district. I always tease people. I, I said, 
He said, you're here early. I said, well, I got on the subway, you know, <laughs> because there is no mass transit here. You know, we're lucky to have anything here, and it's a, it's a struggle. You know, it's something that we try and work at. I think that, that this Hogan administration has improved it quite a bit, but there's a long ways to go. And transportation is one of the most challenging issues, public transportation that we deal with in this district. Um, maintenance of level of services, you know, whether it be doctors, hospital, you know, uh, uh, doctors at the hospital, et cetera. We're trying to hold that and not lose any because we have been losing important services. So my goal is to, to maintain those services and not lose any of the important services for the, especially our aging community in, the, in this district. Thank you. Yeah, a lot's been said already, and we talked about uh, a lot of big issues that are very, very important, not just to Maryland, but our district. Um, but I just want to talk about two things um, that I, I really enjoy about our job. Um, one of them is it's not just the big things, but it's also the small things. Um, it's, it's the, I mean, we're in a service job. Uh, we're in a sort of service-oriented job. We represent a lot of people in District 36. We represent almost 120,000 people in our district. And um, part of the most significant part of our job isn't those 90 days. It's, 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 it's all year. It's 365 days a year. It's all those emails. It's all those calls. We're, we're problem solvers. Um, and that's, that's really the most rewarding part of this job. When you get an email from one of your residents, it doesn't matter where they come from. It, they can come from Barclay, they can come from Elkton, they can come from, from Greensboro. It doesn't matter, or, or anywhere on Kent Island, it doesn't matter where they come from. You know, when you get those emails, you know, you're in the back, you're, you're just trying to figure out how do I solve their problem? And fortunately, with, with our team, um, we've done an outstanding job um, for so long in the Eastern Shore when, you know, statewide, oftentimes we're forgotten about, um, but we're, we're literally on the map now. It's because of the relationships that all four of us have been able to establish, again, not just with the governor's office, but it's also with other legislators. So when we get those emails, we get those phone calls, and we're trying to figure out how to solve, problem solve, we have resources that are available to us, um, and that's what makes our job so fun. Um, is because we're, we're just a phone call away or we're just a text message away from getting answers to people um, and solving their problems. Um, and, and honestly, it's, we don't get paid a whole lot of money um, and we're not, we don't do it. And I can tell you nobody over there does it um, for the money. Um, but it's that feeling that you get um, when, when somebody says thank you or they say, you know what, this, this is awesome. Um, I mean, you, you, you changed my life, you changed our family's life, and um, I mean, that, that's, that's the best part, honestly, of, of our job. Um, and, that, and that's something that happens all year long. Um, yep. Time's up. All right, thank you. <laughs> all right, well, at this time, um, we'd like to start off our, the closing remarks, the candidates' remarks. We're going to start out with um, Mr. Ahrens and then go to Mr. Jacobs and continue around. Um, one minute each. Okay, thank you again for the time tonight. I got to get something in here first. Um, first of all, first and foremost, ladies and gentlemen, I have the experience, uh, and I want to take a moment to thank my colleagues. I work very well with Senator Hershey, Delegate Grice, and Delegate Jacobs. We're a team. We do communicate. We do work on the issues, and we do we do mention these things to it. You know, people talk about whether we're conservatives or we're not. My my experience, the record shows, I actually have a track record. I have been endorsed. But I have been rated by the Maryland for Responsive Government at a 100% rating. That's not a minor feat. I've been uh, for the Americans for Conservative U Union, an excellent rating. It doesn't get, there's only one better than that, and that guy was two points ahead of me. Um, the Maryland Retailers Association gave me a, a star, all star, and I'm endorsed by the largest employer in our state and in our county, and that's going to be the Maryland Farm Bureau. I'm endorsed by the NRA and our Governor Hogan. I've worked with him. He's endorsed me, and I just sit back and I work on the things about the support for saving our base, saving, reducing taxes, cutting taxes, and no tax increase over the four years that I've been in, in the delegation. Thank you. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank everyone for being here this evening. I think it's been a great forum, and uh, thank the League of Women Voters for, for having us. Uh, certainly, uh, I would hope, uh, appreciate you, uh, your vote to send me back for a third term. I think seniority has an important part, especially when you represent the shore and you're a senior delegate. You know, any kind of crumb we can get is important. Uh, they, they like to look at the shore as a, in, insignificant as the senator from Anne Arundel said when he put the bill in to take the authority away. He says, oh, those 400,000 people don't matter that much. Well, I think we do. 
and I'm proud to represent this 400,000. And I think that uh, we speak very loud and very strong. And this team is the, one of the most respected teams in Annapolis, and I'm proud to be part of it. And again, I appreciate your vote. Thank you. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm just asking for your vote for that second term. Um, like anything, I mean, there's a learning curve. Um, you know, what my first year as a house, you know, in the House of Delegates, um, I owned it. I was new. Um, and there, there was a lot to learn. I mean, there's a lot of ideas that I had. There's a lot of things that I wanted to accomplish. Um, but there's also a lot of things that you have to learn as well. Um, and there's a lot of relationships that you have to build. And that's the most important thing. Uh, if you want to get anything accomplished in Annapolis, um, if you don't build those relationships here, it's going to be a lost cause for you. Um, and I've had the, the privilege and I've had the opportunity to do that for the last four years. Um, and so I'm much higher up on my learning curve now. Um, and I can tell you with this second term, I've, I've had a lot of wins, a lot of accomplishments over the last few years. Um, but there's also a lot more to do um, going forward. And I, and I very quickly, um, in our first, we, we, in our first forum up in Cecil County, we talked to a bunch of business owners and, and I asked them the question. I said, you guys are business owners and you have your employees that are asking you to keep their jobs. Why on earth would you ever consider firing them if they're great employees, you have a hard time finding good staff anywhere else and they're asking you to keep their jobs. Um, the four of us, we've done an outstanding job. We put our district on the map. Um, and we haven't heard anything tonight that'll tell you otherwise. So um, if it ain't broke, then don't try to fix it. That's all we have to say. Thank you. It's no surprise that the incumbents would want to keep their jobs. Uh, but don't think that the incumbency rate in this country or the state ought to be 100%. It's not designed to be that way. It shouldn't be that way. It's already 90, 95%. It's far too high. Don't be afraid to try something new. I'm young. I'm equipped. I'll work harder for you than any person in Annapolis to fight for residents of the shore. Um, so don't be afraid to vote for someone who's not an incumbent. And I think I can speak for all of us, and I'll just say this quickly. I'd like to apologize for all candidates everywhere for all the signs that are up. <laughs> I hated signs before I got into politics, but apparently you need them to win. Um, so I would just like to apologize for that, and hopefully we'll get them down here in a few weeks. Thank you. Well, once again, I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters, and thanks to all of you for coming out. Very thoughtful, intelligent, well thought through questions. Uh, I'm running because I believe, as I mentioned earlier, my values are consistent with that of the, uh, with that of the uh, district. You know, I've signed the taxpayer pledge, which means I won't raise your taxes. And the incumbent from Queen Anne's County, when he ran for commissioner on a no-tax uh, platform, shortly thereafter did raise taxes. And, of course, I'll tell you it was a $20 million shortfall on a $120 million budget that caused that. But my question is, shouldn't he have known prior to that? You know, I... I don't know if we need any more expensive surprises. The piggyback tax is the highest allowed in the state of Maryland, which was also part of that. Um, you know, there's an issue trying to change the way we elect commissioners. You know, it, it, look, it's my job to create contrast here. I have no personal beef with, with the incumbent from Queen Anne's County, but you know, I'd like to make Team 36 a better Team 36. If you're tired of the same old establishment games, you have a choice. Please visit my website. RickBowersMaryland.com, and I thank you for your time and attention this evening. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the League of Women Voters would like to express its appreciation and thank all the members of the public for, for coming out and caring about government. Um, and then also, please join me in thanking all of our candidates tonight.